Tonight, alternative energy comes from Hawaii. While the Falcon 9 crash, the failure was actually a success. And Miriam Joar from the Tank Girl blog comes over to geek out. Audrey's Corner is next. Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. Bandwidth for Padres Corner is provided by Cashfly at C A C H E F L Y dot com. This episode of Padres Corner is brought to you by IT Pro TV. Are you looking to upgrade your IT skills or prepare for certification? IT Pro TV offers engaging and informative tutorials streamed to your Roku, computer, or mobile device. For a free seven day trial and 30% off the lifetime of your account, go to itpro.tv slash PC and use the code PC30. This is Padres Corner, episode 21, recorded January 20th, 2015. Geeking out with the tank girl. Welcome to Padres Corner. I'm Father Robert Ballas here, the digital Jesuit Padre SJ in the Twit TV chat room. Padres Corner is a show where we basically just kick around the news of the week and find the little bits that have fallen through the cracks. Lisa and Leo decided that we needed a show that would cater to the geeks, to the geeks, the gals of chat room. And that's what Padres Corner is, a place for you to be in the mind of a Jesuit priest and see if you come out sane on the other side. And is our case, we're going to start off with some freaking engineering. Now, if you've watched this show at all, you know that I'm pretty big into alternative energies. I love solar. I love wind power. In fact, I'm even a fan of nuclear. Anything that can get us away from burning things in order to generate power, I'm all about. And close to my heart is solar. There's something about solar that just makes me squee like a little schoolboy. The idea of having something with no moving parts that can turn sunlight directly into usable electricity is something that very much excites me. Now, I've watched solar panels become more affordable, more accessible, and far more efficient over the years. The panels that I played with as a child were maybe 5% efficient. Now, since then, common panels today can hit 28 to 30% efficiency, and uh, they're much closer to the theoretical max of a silicon cell, which is 34%. But though I love solar, there are still a couple of major problems that some entities have come up with. The, the biggest one is that it's transient power. Uh, you know this. If, if you have solar cells on your roof, or, or even if you use one of those solar chargers in order to give uh, your batteries a little extra zip, you understand that you want them in direct sunlight. Anything less than direct sunlight means that you're sapping them of power that they can be converting into electrical energy. Well, what if, what if you run a grid of solar panels? What if you provide multiple megawatts of solar power and you have a cloud move over your farm? That's not just a minor inconvenience. That could be damaging. In fact, if you have that array tied into a grid, it could destroy equipment, not just in the power station, but downstream. In fact, that's something that Hawaii has run into over the past couple of years. Hawaii has been experimenting with solar power, specifically the island of Kauai. They have a, a, a massive investment in solar power. In fact, they've quintupled the amount of solar energy that they generate in the last year. Now, in order to keep that from happening, these power providers have used a combination of batteries, backup generators, and other power sources to balance the grid. But as we continue to talk more and more about moving into these alternative energies, that becomes more problematic. What happens when your solar farm now becomes 10, 20, 30, 40, 50, 80 megawatts of power? It's not so easy to create a battery bank that could cover the dips. It's not so easy to create diesel generators that can spool up fast enough to cover that, that loss of frequency because that's what happens. Let's say, for example, you've got, uh, again, that 100 megawatt grid tie of solar arrays. You get some clouds over it. Suddenly you're losing 40, 50, 60, 80 percent of your solar power in less than 60 seconds and then suddenly comes back. You need something to fill in that loss of power. Otherwise, you start to drop the frequency here in the United States below 60 hertz. And if you drop below that level, you actually start to damage appliances that might be plugged into the grid. That's just unacceptable. So in Kauai, they've got an 80 megawatt array of solar power. In fact, it provides about 80% of the island's peak power requirements. 
But that solar flux that we just talked about, that, uh, that, uh, that dip that you can get whenever you get clouds coming over your panels, has pretty much destroyed their battery backup. They had a lead acid plant that would provide transient power in order to keep the grid from dropping below 60 hertz. And that transient power was supposed to last for eight years, but they found that they've destroyed it, made it pretty much useless in two. So what are they to do? What will Kauai do? How, how will this real-life laboratory of alternative energy survive? Well, they're going to survive by switching to laptop batteries. Okay, not laptop batteries, but the batteries that you know for being in your laptops and in your mobile devices. They're moving over to lithium-ion. Now, this isn't a magic bullet. Lithium-ion doesn't suddenly make everything okay. But this new system that they're going to be using from SAFT can deliver 12 megawatts in short bursts and can sustain charging at 4.5 megawatts, which means that it can provide huge bursts of power when you've got that dip and it can be charged very quickly. Now, combine this with some of the technologies that we've talked about on Padre's Corner, adding carbon nanotubes into the, uh, the chemistry or changing the chemistry so that it could accept massive amounts of power. Remember, we talked about a bus that could recharge its batteries in just under 45 seconds. Put those technologies together along with solar or wind or any other transient alternative energy, and maybe your future city might be powered by a taste of Hawaii. Now, when we come back, I'm, I'm just kind of feeling a mini rant coming on. It's, I, I know it's there. I, I feel it coming. I feel it coming on. I, I want to talk a little bit about the Falcon 9. That's SpaceX's latest attempt to uh, land a booster for their reusable rocket system onto a barge. There's been a lot of trash talk. In fact, there's been a lot of people who I don't think quite understand what's been going on with SpaceX. And uh, I think it's time for the folks at Padres Corner to set them straight. But before we do that, let's go ahead and talk about the first sponsor of this episode of Padres Corner, and it's IT Pro TV. Now, I, I do enterprise engineering. Technology. That's my thing. That's actually what brought me into Twit TV. Leo wanted an enterprise show, and that was my expertise. But as we've been doing this week in enterprise tech over the last two and a half years, there's been a lot of people who, well, they've been wanting to get into IT. They've been wanting to get into enterprise tech, but it seems a little daunting. Right? How do you get in? Aside from apprenticing or, or dedicating all your time and, and spending a lot of money to buy the equipment, how do you learn the skills that you need to do enterprise IT? Well, that's what IT Pro TV is for. IT Pro TV is a video network dedicated exclusively, exclusively to the world of information technology. Whether you're looking to jump start a career in IT or you're already working in the field, IT Pro TV supplements traditional learning methods in a fun and engaging way to maximize your learning and prepare you for certification. They offer hundreds of hours of contents, with 30 hours being added each week. Their library includes video courses on Microsoft, Cisco, Apple, A+, CCNA, Security+, MCSA, CISSP, PowerShell, and Linux+, Plus, covering topics like network security, Linux, Windows, OS X support for desktops, servers, and more. But IT doesn't have to be boring. IT Pro TV hosts tell engaging stories and share personal experiences to increase your retention, the shows are streamed live and they're available on demand to your Roku, your computer, or mobile devices, even Chromecast. And you can interact with the host during the show with topic-specific based Q&A. Uh, if this sounds familiar, it's because the folks over at IT Pro TV are actually fans of Twit TV. They've got the same TriCast or the same cameras. In fact, they're using the same model for the, the chat room because they're fans of Twit and they realize that they want people to learn and be entertained because that's the way that you retain the information. That's what IT Pro TV is all about. Oh, even if you're currently doing a certification program, IT Pro TV can help you with that. They've got a fantastic supplemental program to help you learn at your own pace and your own progress. They include measure up practice exams so that you can find out how ready you are for your certification exam, as well as, and this is my personal favorite, a virtual machine sandbox. If you've ever wondered how you could get your hands on millions of dollars worth of equipment, this is how you do it. Through your browser, you can configure virtual networks. Learning doesn't get better than that. Now, you can get all of this for one low monthly price, which includes daily updates and new monthly features. It's comparable to the cost of a study guide, and it's really much cheaper than going to an IT boot camp. So this is what we want you to do. We want you to upgrade your brain with the most popular IT certifications recognized by employers today. Go to itpro.tv slash PC 
You're going to get a free seven-day trial when you sign up using our offer code PC30, which will allow you to check their courses, their live stream, and more. Subscriptions are normally $57 per month or $570 for the entire year, but we have a special offer because they're huge fans of Twit. If you sign up now and use the code PC30, you'll receive 30% off your subscription for the lifetime of your account. That's less than $40 per month or $399 for the entire year. And once you reach your 13th month, they'll reduce your subscription rate even further, bringing your cost down to $24.95 a month or $249 for the entire year. That's itpro.tv slash PC. itpro.tv slash PC. And use the code PC30 to try it free for seven days and save 30%. And we thank IT Pro TV for their support of Padres Corner. Let's get back into it. Now, if you have been watching the interwebs at all, then you've probably seen this vine. This is a vine of the Falcon 9 rocket booster making an attempt to land on an automated unmanned barge out in the middle of the ocean. Now, as Elon Musk said, close but no cigar. This time, they're promising to come back. Uh, many of us have delighted to this because it's, it's, you know, it's reaching. It's, it's taking technology way past what it was designed to do. And even though it was a failure, there were a lot of us who were very, very much loving the fact that they tried. It was a long shot, at best. But SpaceX did it because they wanted the data points for creating the ultimate reusable spacecraft. A spacecraft that could return its booster, not into the ocean like we did with the space shuttle, or not junk it off into some desert area like we've done with some other supply craft, but return it to a barge where it could be refurbished and returned to use with very little refurbishment. Now, this is the dream of space travel, and SpaceX reached not quite making it all the way. But a strange thing happens on the internet. I, I don't know if you, you, you know about this, but sometimes on the internet, people are mean. <laughs> what we've seen over the past couple of uh, days is that in forums, on Twitter, Facebook, G+, in snarky comments being made around the, uh, the world, there are people who evidently believe that this was nothing more than a spectacular failure that goes to show that Elon Musk and the SpaceX team are hacks. The strangest comment I read was, we landed, on, we landed the Saturn V on the moon billions of miles away three decades ago, and SpaceX can't land a tiny rocket on Earth. Okay, I know this is being pedantic, but a few things you should know about that. One, we did not land the Saturn V booster on the moon. We landed a lunar module. Two, the moon is not billions of miles away. It's between 225 and 405,000 miles from Earth. And three... We did not land on the moon three decades ago. We landed on the moon almost five decades ago. But beyond that, beyond the snark, beyond me just being kind of an arse, there is something else that you have to understand about this quote-unquote failure. And that is what we did with the moon, landing the lunar module on the moon, landing spacecraft on the moon, landing robots on the moon, as the Soviet Union did, is nothing like what SpaceX is trying to do with the Falcon 9. Let's just look at some of the differences. First, the moon has one-sixth the gravity of Earth. That's 9.7 meters per second squared versus 1.6 meters per second squared. So it's much easier to do a powered descent to the surface of the moon. Two, the moon has a relatively stable surface. A barge in the middle of the ocean does not. And three, and this is the big one. When you talk about something like a lunar lander, it's got, sense, it's got thrusters, thruster packs in all axes so that you can more easily control the ship. That's what it's designed to do. The lunar module was designed to land on the moon, and that's why they designed it with all the different types of technology that they would need in order to be able to do that. The, the Falcon 9 rocket is not like that. In fact, this is, this is the, the comparison. Uh, and a lander, like you've got with a lunar lander, would have some thrusters pointing down, some thrusters pointing on each side. So, for example, if you wanted to move left, you activate the thrusters on the right. If you want to move right, you activate the thrusters on the left. If you want to change your angle, you use a combination of the thrusters around the craft to rotate it into the proper position. On the Falcon 9, as you can see here, there's one thruster. Just one. The engine. Now, that engine is a fantastic engine. It uh, has a vectored thrust novel so that it can do the approximate work of various thruster packs, but still, it's one engine. In fact, the way that the Falcon 9 booster made it that far is fantastic because it expends almost all of its fuel to get the payload into space. 
but then it relights that engine three different times, the last time right before the barge, and uses that vector thrust to get the, the rocket within the right position. The fact that the rocket was able to hit the barge at all is a technological wonder. People don't realize how much how, how difficult it is to balance something that weighs that much essentially on a plume of thrust. It's like trying to hold a broom up by the handle. It, it's not the easiest thing to do. So beyond being pedantic, again, and, and not trying to be the, uh, the techno know-it-all, but I, I think people need to give SpaceX a lot more credit for what they did with the Falcon 9. There is no arguing that the Falcon 9 impact was spectacular. But for all the technical challenges it overcame, it was a spectacular impact. And as much as it affords rocket engineering, it was also a spectacular success. Now, that's it for my mini rant. I know that's, that's not nearly as much vitriol as I throw, but uh, you know what? There's, there's been a lot of good stuff going on. And speaking of good stuff, I've got a guest for this episode of Padres Corner. You know, this is my favorite part, when we get to bring somebody in and uh, talk about what makes them a geek. Ladies and gentlemen, I uh, welcome to Padres Corner the one, the only, the tank girl, Miriam. And and Miriam, I, I don't want to miss say your last name, so how do you say that again? Joar. Hi. Joar. I, I, just, I, I keep wanting to say Joare. I'm not, I'm not sure. It's that's that's what Leo said for a long time, even on the air. And uh, what, you know, I kept correcting him, and I think he kept forgetting. But now he's got it, which is awesome. It took a few joie, tries. Joie. You know, he's, I, he's Leo. I'm not going to correct Leo on air every time. I, I think we just we want to we make we want to make it more European sounding, more French sounding. Mm -hmm. Joire. Exactly. Joire. Yeah, ex now, of, joie. of course, if, if people uh, people may know you, you've got a very popular blog. You've got the Tank Girl Mobile. You are all about everything mobile, everything Android. That's that's your beat. Yeah, I do. I mean, I do. I'm kind of operating system agnostic, although I am, you know, well known to be a, primarily an Android user at this time. Uh, that wasn't always the case. You know, for many years, I was a Symbian user. Uh, so I've been using smartphones since 2004, roughly. Uh, and, and, and camera phones, uh, I've been, uh, cameras are one of my on phones are one of my, like my interests. So, um, you know, I, I have an iPhone and I write about the iPhone. I, I have a, a lot of affinity for Nokia because of the old days. And, um, even though I'm not like a huge fan of, well, I should say I like Windows Phone, but I don't feel I can be productive enough to make it in my main OS on a on a mobile device. I really love the Lumia devices for their imaging chops, and for the you know they kind of pack all the goodness, all this years and years of, of Nokia's know how now Microsoft devices, you know, packed in one device. Like you you see them, and you know it's the best hardware really. Um, the, 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 just the, the, the chops and all the little detail is really second to none. And that's what I get excited about with mobile tech. And I do a lot of wearables, you know, I used to work at Pebble, so I love wearables, uh, basically anything that's mobile and technology. I love cars. I consider cars to be mobile technology. So sometimes I review cars on my blog too. Oh yeah. I've seen this uh, Mercedes C111. That thing looks kind of sexy right there. <laughs> yeah. Right on. <laughs> uh, uh, Miriam. Before we go more into you, I, I do want to digress because you brought it up, but this uh, the <laughs> idea of Windows Phone, it's kind of a sore spot for me. I, I actually really like the look of Windows Phone. I think they me had too. the opportunity to do something great. Like you, I think Nokia's hardware is second to none. It is beautiful, gorgeous, efficient, well-designed hardware, but uh, Windows Phone's kind of dead now, right? It's a non-starter. Well, I mean, it is, I think for all practical purposes, for the majority of, the, of your listeners, I would say, and viewers, I would say that's true. I think there are some pockets in some countries where Windows Phone still outsells the other platforms. I believe potentially not outsell, but have a very large market share, like, like I think Italy, surprisingly, for example. Right, right. India. Uh, India is really big on Windows Phone. But what I would say is that the place that Windows Phone occupies today that I think still makes it relevant is the entry level space. If you want a smartphone today that gives you all the functionality of a smartphone, you would be far, far better served at a hundred dollar price point. And I'm talking a hundred dollar unsubsidized. So when you don't roll that price into your contract at a hundred dollars today and less, 
I think the cheapest is about $80 now for a Lumia. You can get a full-blown, high-quality smartphone in your hand today from Microsoft devices, formerly Nokia, running Windows Phone. And the reason it's so good is actually a usable device that you know you don't feel frustrated using day to day. Is um, it's much, in my opinion, much more usable than the equivalently priced Android devices, and I, in that sense, I think it's relevant still. And until somebody can make Android run that well, like until I get myself a, an LG or Samsung phone that costs a hundred dollars unsubsidized, that can perform as well and be as usable. And as well made as a Lumia for hundred dollars, I think that Windows Phone still has relevancy. But you're right. For most of us in North America, in Europe, who buy our phones generally subsidized, and a hundred dollars buys us, you know, a, a, a flagship device, it doesn't make any sense to go Windows Phone right now. So you know, that's my take on it. No, I, I'm I'm absolutely with you. I I'm rooting for Windows Phone. I, Me I, too. I think it's a clean UI. I don't think any OI, not not iOS, not Android, has it's the easiest to use for people who come from a non-smartphone world. Exactly, and want right? The main apps, like they want Facebook, they want Twitter, they want Instagram, they want maybe Uber. All these apps exist. Most of the big apps exist now, thankfully. There's still a lot missing. Uh, my biggest problem is that as a tech savvy early adopter type person, um, I'm heavily invested in the Google ecosystem in terms of my the services I use. Now, if I were to use an an Apple phone like an iPhone, I'd be perfectly served because uh, and uh, Google makes these apps, right? They make these apps for iOS, and they they are often and sometimes even better than the Android equivalents until you know the the, the cycle catches up. So they. You know, I can use an iPhone for my main device. There are some issues here around, you know, the lack of file system and stuff. I'm, you know, that's why I prefer Android. I have a better workflow on Android. But with Windows Phone, I'm lacking such essential services for me because of the Google services that it it makes it very difficult for me to use. A, even though their flagship devices are fantastic, right? So I think for me, that's what it, if you ever get a chance to play with a a cheap Android phone, like an entry level Android phone, you will, and if you're a user of a high end Android phone, you will be uh, uh, astounded at how useless and terrible the experience is. Imagine yourself coming from a dumb phone, being told by everyone, hey, you need to buy a smartphone. It's 2015, and you buy this cheap Android phone, and it's a disaster of an experience. And then compare that experience to the same price Lumia device running Windows Phone, and you'll know exactly what I'm talking about. Right, right. Now, uh, let, let's step back from the mobile devices for a bit because we're going to talk a lot about that later on. I want to talk more about you. Uh, this, is, ah. this is what we do with guests. We figure out, you know, where did they come from? Where did they get their Greek geek cred? Why, uh -huh. why do they do what they do today? Now, we know that you're in the mobile. We know that you're a journalist. We know that you're a blogger. We know that you're big into tech. But where did that come from? Uh, so, first of all, where, where did you grow up? So I grew up in the south of France. My dad uh, was French. He's passed away. And my mom uh, is German. So I got this kind of uh, interesting blend of, of, you know, Southern European French uh, Latin uh, culture to combine with kind of the Northern European, because my mom is from Northern Germany, like close to Denmark. So there's kind of like the, the Viking culture almost, you know, the, the Northern uh, uh, cultures. And uh, I grew up with that, which I think kind of introduced me to a whole wide range of, of interesting things. Uh, when I was uh, 16 or 17, I moved to English speaking Canada, the part of Canada where, you know, a lot of things people think I'm French Canadian because I have two passports and that I speak French, but actually the French comes from Europe. And my, my Canadian experience has always been a, an English experience. So I came to Canada to go to college. Um, uh, to go to university uh, in uh, in and around Toronto. There's a, there's a city not far from Toronto called London, Ontario. And I went there, uh, University of Western Ontario, for a number of years. And, you know, by the time I graduated, uh, you know, I kind of did a degree and a half. I spent a lot of time in, in university. And then I, I did some research uh, in a bunch of the university labs. So I spent about 10 years on campus. And I... Um, 
I thought to myself, I'm not going to go back to France. You know, I have a great education. It's an English education. There's a lot of opportunity with technology, which is something I've always been fascinated by. Why don't I stay in North America? And so I became a Canadian citizen after a number of years. And you know, eventually I moved to Vancouver on the West Coast. Uh, and I worked in video games, somehow landed jobs in video games. This was in the mid nineties. Um, when I got into video games and I worked at a video game developer for 15 years and then I moved to, uh, the U S in 2002 or so, uh, to San Francisco here where I live today. And I eventually married an American and, you know, I have a green card. So I've got like th kind of three countries basically in my, well, four, if you count Germany, cause I spent a lot of time there as a child, but that's in a nutshell, kind of the story. Oh, wow. So so it, it, living in France and then coming over to Canada, what got you into tech? So I think it started when I was in France. I was always fascinated. Like from a young age, I was just fascinated with technology. You know, uh, people put Legos in front of me and, and like other kind of construction sets and I would just build stuff, you know. Um, I was actually fascinated by architecture. I, I thought I was going to be an architect growing up. So the design and like the, in, in the same way as I kind of have this mix of cultures, the Southern French and the, the Northern German in my life, I always have had a lot of science and technology in my life and a lot of arts and uh, literature in my life. So, you know, my, my the both sides were well represented in my family. So architecture seemed like a great way to combine the two to me until I discovered computers. I was very lucky. So I'm, I'm 46. I look a lot younger than I am. I just turned 46 at CS actually. And uh, when I was nine years old, in 1978, I got exposed to the first personal computer. And back then that meant, you know, an Apple II or a TRS-80 or, you know, something like that. So I was very lucky to get exposed and be shown BASIC, the programming language. And I started, I didn't have my own computer, but I would go to my dad's friend's house who had one. And I would make these little programs that, you know, basically were silly games. And, and I learned to program by myself. And... Um, Eventually, uh, like in the early 80s, I got my own computer. So I, I started programming early on. By the time I went to college, to university in Canada, I, had, I was pretty good. And um, what happened was I ended up getting a job uh, part-time on campus at the computer lab doing IT work, which I'm sure you're quite familiar with from your show, right? <laughs> Uh, and so, uh, the IT work, this was like 1988 or so. So you can, it's the birth of the internet as we know it, the public internet. So I was exposed to the early internet and to a plethora of operating systems, Windows, OS2, Linux, Unix. Well, this was pre-Linux, so Unix, um, Mac OS, a whole bunch of computers trying to all talk on the network and talk to other computers and other parts of academia. So I was just in the right place at the right time. I had some computer skills. I got a job in computers and I was studying engineering like hardware, but I quickly n realized I was going to be a software engineer. Right. And so, um, by the time I graduated with my, uh, I actually decided to change my major and do a, uh, a major in applied mathematics. I felt like I was trying to solve all these computer problems for professors in their labs, and I didn't just didn't have the math skills to do it. So I figured that I can do the programming on my own. I need to get the math skills to help them solve their problems. So I became a research assistant, spent a lot of time doing medical research, uh, hearing research, medical imaging, things like MRI, x-rays. I basically played in lab like a mad scientist for many years before I moved to Vancouver and started my video game career. And video games just happened by accident. You know, I knew someone who knew someone who worked at EA. Uh, they were starting their own company. They're like, hey, there's seven of us. We're doing a startup. You want to join us? We're trying to make this crazy game. And so the next thing you know, I work on this game for two years and it, it gets published and it's like one of the most successful PC uh, real-time strategy games ever made. It's called Homeworld. You probably heard of it. Of course. Um, and so, you know, I became a programmer completely by accident, but technology has always been with me. And, and I've always been fascinated, particularly with music. I play music, I've learned music, I'm formally trained as a, a musician, and I love the idea of intersection between technology and music. So early on, it was like stereo equipment and synthesizers <laughs> and, and, you know, stuff like that. And then as I grew older, it was kind of more... Uh, you know, the, the reason I got into the phones is because I've always dreamt of having a portable computer, but I could never afford it. And when I, and mobile phones were like, yeah, whatever, I don't care. It's a communication device. 
But then when I realized, oh, wait, I can listen to music on that and I can record music and I can take photos and I can do my email. Now I have a computer in my hand, right? Like I, I got the smartphone thing before the smartphone was a thing. And that's how I got to start. And, I, and a friend of mine, you know, we would have these conversations at the coffee shop in the early 2000s here in, in, in San Francisco when I was making video games. And he'd be like, hey, you know, we keep talking about all this stuff and you're so passionate about it. You should blog about it. Blogging is big. And I'm like, I don't know how to write, dude, you know? And he's like, I'll just do it. You'll become a better writer for your job. You probably have to write manuals and stuff from time to time for, you know, uh, instructions for your, your colleagues on how to code, like com even just commenting in your code. So I just started writing and this blog that you're looking at right now, I haven't really changed the design much since 2006 when I started it. And, uh, lo and behold, the next thing, you know, uh, I'm working in video games, but my blog is taking more and more of my time and other blogs are picking up my stories and, you know, I'm growing this social media presence completely organically, not really knowing what the hell I was doing. So anyway, I could go on forever, but you get the gist of it. Technology has always been a part of my life. Uh, th there was one little bit in there when you said that you decided you wanted to be a computer engineer. Uh, this is a question that I, I've asked of some people on one of my other shows, Coding 101. And that is, there are some people who watch our shows and who will write me and they really want to be a computer engineer because they see the salary and they see, oh, I don't want to be left behind. There's these developers who are making millions and billions of dollars. And so they figure, I'll just learn the skill. I'll learn the language. I'll learn what the syntax is. And then I'll be a developer. But uh, where do you fall here? I, I'm, I'm of the mind I that didn't... there are some people who just, if you don't have that natural inclination, that natural desire to solve things and put them into computer language, yeah. you just can't, you can't just be a developer. It's, it's not like you just choose to be a developer if you don't have the aptitude. I, I didn't do it for the money. I, yeah. I did it for passion. Like from a young age, you know, I was always playing with the wrong toys and like taking things apart and putting them back together. I did a lot of that. Like, and oftentimes breaking them because I had, you have to learn. But by my early teens, you know, in the eighties, when I was in high school, Walkman were a big thing. And my friends would break their Walkman and give them to me and say, can you fix it? And I would take them apart and fix them. And eventually I actually created a little bit of a side business in my high school years. I would order the parts from Sony, which was one of the biggest Walkman manufacturer then and a few other manufacturers to fix my friend's Walkman for, for a small fee. And, you know, I did a little small business doing that. So for me, it's always been a part of my life. I, I don't know how to explain to you, but I've always taken things apart and naturally understood how they work, you know? Um, and, and then, you know, I'm one of those people who can look at the trunk of a car, you know, with a bunch of luggage in front of the car and go, yeah, I'm playing that game of Tetris, Tetris. Right now. Yeah. And it's exactly, I know exactly how it's going to work out before I even touch anything. I, I am and always, I am the family packer because I can figure out how to use up every little inch in that trunk. And, and I don't know, like, it's like, I'm not trying to be like cool about it. It's just, it's just, I can visualize it in my head. Uh, you know, and I think um, you. Do, I think you're right. There is a certain kind of like, you know, I was born that way. I don't know, but at the same time, you know, I think I was lucky because I had a family that didn't say, "Well, you know, this is not for you. You shouldn't be interested in this. You should be interested in other things." And they let me explore that. They let me play with the Legos. They let me get dirty outside, and you know, they let me take things apart, even though they got mad at me when I broke them. And so I'm grateful that I had um, a family that that was that let me do that. Right. And then you know later on I was able to actually do it and you know make it make it a career. But it's funny because for a long time I really thought hardware was the thing. Like even though I'd been I'd learned software from an early age, I, I didn't think I was going to get a career in software. I thought engineering, electrical engineering, was going to be it. That's why I chose that that major when I first started. And the thing that's interesting too is that you have to you have to put it in context. A lot of your viewers and listeners right now are probably thinking, well, you know, I can go to school to become a video game developer today. But when I became a video game developer, there was no video game developer school. You just learn that stuff on your own, right? I mean, um, and 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 further than that, when I went to university in the late 80s, you if you went into computer science you were going to end up being a programmer writing fortran and cobol for a bank in some basement mainframe somewhere you you had to do graduate studies before you get anything interesting in terms of computing
And so I didn't want to do that. That's why I chose it hardware, like, because I thought, well, you know, I can always do the software stuff as an aside. But by the time I graduated, it was very clear to me that software was a thing. And, and I think the, by the mid-90s, you know, the attitude had changed in, in academia that software should be taught early on and should be a discipline of its own, right? Right. Right. And I think it's, it's, you know, one of my instructors told me that uh, if you're going to have a passion for this, especially for software, because it's not tactile like hardware. And if you want to work with hardware, you know when it's working and you know that you've got something because it's in front of you. But you have to be able to have that little, that sense of achievement, that, that sense of I did something when you, when you have something modeled correctly. And if you yeah. can't have that, then you might have the skills to do it but you don't have the passion. And if you like, like you, if you don't have the passion, then why are you doing it? Yeah. yeah. And so, you know, the next thing, you know, uh, and gadget tries to hire me. And at the time I was still trying to, I still I started working, getting my green card in the U S so I couldn't just work anywhere I wanted. Right. I could, I had a job, they had a visa for me. I could work there. I was actually working for Dolby labs, the company that does the sound for the movie theaters and stuff. Um, and I was trying to get a green card and I finally got it. But until I got my green card, I couldn't do freelance work. So Engadget was trying to pick me up and pick me up. And eventually I got my green card and I, and I joined Engadget as a freelancer doing a, like a column a month. And then the whole big thing happened where a bunch of the senior editors uh, left to start The Verge. It wasn't called The Verge at the time, but they, you know, they went to do their own thing. And around that time... That created a vacuum, that created a void at Engadget. And even though I kind of wanted to go out with these guys, they weren't really ready to take me on because, you know, they weren't, they weren't launching yet. But I'm like, if I'm going to leave my nice, cushy, well-paying engineering job, I want to, you know, make a, make a splash. So I saw more of an opportunity at Engadget to do that uh, by becoming senior mobile editor and, and, you know, winging it. I mean... I'd been blogging for a while, but it's still a huge thing to go from doing it as a hobby to doing it as a full-time job. And thankfully, the people that ran the show there believed in me and let me do it. And the next thing you know is three and a half years go by and I run in all the mobile stuff for Engadget and I'm maintaining all the relationships with Apple and Google and HTC. And I, I get to know all these people in the industry and see, I interview Stephen Elop several times and, you know, we're on each other's Rolodex. Like it's, it's insane, like the kind of exposure a job like Engadget gave me. Um, I think it helped that I'm recognizable, that I did a lot of video interviews so people would either hate me or love me. A lot of, a lot of hate mail um, because I'm a bit of a freak, I admit. But... You know what? You um, have to be a freak in this business. I know. It's a little crazy. bit. Like, people don't understand. Like, they think air, being an air traffic controller is the most stressful uh, job in the world. I don't think so, actually. I actually think that being a tech reporter <laughs> uh, at Mobile Congress or at CES is probably the most stressful thing. I used to think finishing a video game, the last two or three months of a video game, when you didn't sleep, you slept under your desk because, you know, you're fixing all these last minute bugs, you know, and there are millions of dollars were writing on this game going live, you know big plants were sitting there waiting to manufacture cartridges and CDs and DVDs of your game. And if you screwed up one bit of code, all of these thousands of dollars of cartridges would have to be destroyed and restarted. So you really better have your, your stuff together, right? That's the kind of pressure I worked with in video games. That's nothing compared to the pressure of working in tech. It moves so fast. You blink an eye, you wake up in the morning after maybe five hours of sleep and you, you think to yourself, I'd better get out of bed now because I probably have a thousand emails to deal with. And if I miss something important, I'm going to get fired. I mean, you're not going to get fired, but you know what I'm saying? Like oh, yeah. you feel like you're going to get fired. Yeah. So that's the kind, and you know, that's why I went to Pebble eventually because I, you know, it's either I was going to become editor in chief at Engadget and, you know, maybe do that for a couple of years and kind of retire and do something else. Or I was, you know, going to cut my losses and leave early. And that doesn't, it didn't look like the editor-in-chief stuff might work. And then these, this pebble thing was sitting there. And um, I was like, you know, being an entrepreneur is something that I've always wanted to do. I kind of did it when I joined one of the early video game studios. By the way, that was Relic Entertainment that did Homeworld. I was employee number nine. Um, and so this entrepreneurial working in a startup environment on a product I'm really passionate about with people I really like was something that was very appealing to me and also kind of scale down the level of intensity a bit. You know, I, I know how to get intense. I can sustain intense for hours and days on end, but 
I, you know, was starting to sacrifice some of my uh, well-being, some of my family, some of my friends uh, uh, by not being there for them uh, too much. So having a job in a startup, you're going to say it doesn't seem like a good idea to help with that, but you'd be surprised that it's much less intense than working in the tech blogging world. So I did Pebble for a year. It was a really great experience. I learned a lot. I made even more relationships and now I'm just doing freelance work. Um, I'm looking for a full-time gig. If something nice comes along, I really have to be picky and choosy because I know what I want. But at the same time, freelancing is a great opportunity. I do freelance as a media person, as a reporter, as a tech journalist. But I also do a lot of freelance work right now uh, in, uh, in helping startups get started with uh, a whole bunch of stuff, like basically consultancy, strategy, product, product strategy, media, media strategy, that kind of stuff. You're already getting a lot of accolades in our chat room from Homeworld. There was a lot of OMGs in, about Homeworld. <laughs> oh my gosh, I, I played uh, that game forever. Yeah, so I'm responsible for the sound engine on Homeworld. I did, uh, together with somebody named Shane, I can't remember his last name, we together very much designed the sound engine from scratch. The challenge at the time, you guys have to rewind in your head. Uh, bear with me here. I know you guys are a bunch of nerds, so you'll be able to rewind. Put yourself in the shoes when the Pentium 200 uh, MMX was a thing. Oh, Pentium 160. 6 right, MMX, right. whatever, was a thing. Do you remember that? Oh, of course. That was the baseline we were aiming for when we launched. Of course, the Pentium 2 was already out, but that was a high-end system. So now imagine having to do, uh, having just a CD-ROM, no DVD, and the maximum storage on a CD-ROM being 650 megabytes. You have to understand there's 700 megabyte CDs, but at the time to press a CD in the factory, it could only be 650. So imagine I have to create a sound engine that's three-dimensional sound, immersive, that mixes like something like 16 channels in real time on a Pentium 200 MMX uh, and that uh, and store five hours worth of content on a CD that's really designed to only play 16 minutes of music. Yeah, right? So that was the challenge. And we came up with completely new technology, Shane and I, to make that happen. We wrote our own codec. What a codec is, is a compression algorithm like MP3 to fit all that music on the disc. And the, the, it would create speech on the fly. Like it would stitch together the sentences that the computer voice, like the Cortana equivalent on the game, uh, would say. So we had to create all this from scratch. And so that's, that was my job at Homeworld, was uh, to work on all that stuff. And it was a lot of fun. Yeah, there, there was something special about the early days of computer engineering when the limiting factor was almost always, well, the hardware just can't do that. We don't have fast enough processors. We don't have enough storage. Nowadays, you've got the storage, you've got the speed, and so yeah. you, it's really kind of opened up what's possible. But those early days, I, I have nothing but respect for the engineers who could make a computer do something that technically it shouldn't have been able to do. Right. And that was exactly what I went for when I joined the company. Like they said to me, the, you know, the interview was like seven of us sitting around in, in a circle, uh, you know, hanging out, eating Cheetos and talking about how we were going to make this game. And then we talked enough about it that they said, hey, you're high. Come on board. You, you know what you're doing. You'll make the sound engine work. You know, that's how it was back then. Like, because if you could show that you could code that's that's all you needed right and um and i also think that it was really challenging and fun that's why i went with it like towards the end of my video game career i was working mostly on what's called middleware which is basically kind of lego building blocks of software that uh the game designers and game uh, programmers can use to just make the games uh because back in the days when i started you we made our own engines like Homeworld's graphic engine, there is three versions of it. Like it auto detects what hardware you have when you launch it. If you have an old PC and you try it or emulate it on a, on a DOS box, it has um, direct 3D support for whatever old version, direct X5 or something, maybe even before that three. And it has open GL support for cards that had GL. Um, it also supported uh, the 3D FX cards. Uh, which was a separate renderer, and then it supported software. And what's great about this is if you run a software renderer today, you can render Homeworld at something like HD resolutions, which it was <laughs> never designed to do. But it works because the guys who made that engine thought of that. 
They're like, one day, somebody in 10 years, 20 years is going to run the game emulated on some kind of crazy hardware we can't even imagine today. And if we make a software renderer, they'll be able to run it like at 32-bit color depth, you know, 3,000 by 2,000 pixel resolution, and it'll still run and look fantastic. And guess what? It does. I, I prefer the earlier games, like on my old IBM uh, 8080, where wow, they, they wow. didn't think of that at all. And so you had to have that turbo button to slow down the computer oh, yeah. because yeah. games that were designed for the older machines would run double, triple, quadruple speed. So you had to, no, 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 slow back down, become the old computer. Yeah, yeah. That's, uh, that's the opposite of foresight. <laughs> yeah, so, you know, um, I, I'm one of my favorite, like, I like these old games a lot. Like, I, like, I love to play games like Asteroids and, and uh, you know, of course, uh, Space Invaders is still one of my favorites. I know it's such a simple game, right? Uh, Pac-Man, uh, Lemmings, a little bit newer. The the Laser, Laser Shoot, Suit Larry series are pretty good. Um, but anyway, you, you know, I... I never really got into the modern games, even though I worked on them. Like I played them, I know how to play them. But it's just to me, there was, and that's why I like mobile games today. There's a, they're so easy to pick up. You just pick up the phone and you just start playing and you have a great time. You know, to me, those are the games I really get into. I don't get into the really difficult combo games or the games where, you know, you have to be really twitchy and fast. And and I'm not saying they're wrong. Like I I admire the simulation games and the first time the first person shooters. They're incredible. And the the puzzle games, the adventure games. But for me, you know, it's just I just want to be able to pick it up and feel instant gratification that I'm not a complete loser playing the game right off the bat. You know what I'm saying? Uh, with you, I, I'm not a Twitch gamer. Uh, I don't do RTS. Uh, I I can do you know FPS, but I'm not great at it anymore. I, I used to be a lot better when I was younger. But but like you, I I very much admire a game that I can pick up, yeah. enjoy for 30 minutes, and then put it down. Uh, so yeah. So you know when when I joined in Gadget. For me, it was gonna, it was there. I was I was basically making sound engines in in a can, like preset sound engines for companies like Dolby and Sony. I worked at Sony Computer Entertainment. I was the uh, developer evangelist for audio for PS3 and PlayStation Portable PSP. So. Um, you know, I went to conferences and I stood on stage and I introduced all oh, the latest sound engine from Sony for PlayStation 3, you know, blah, blah, blah. Um, and, and so, but games themselves would just use these building blocks by the time, you know, I left the video game industry. They would use these building blocks that I created, but they wouldn't really people wouldn't do it in-house anymore, which is what happened with Homeworld and why, what I did for many of my early years in video games. And, and I missed that. So either I was going to go into blogging full-time because blogging had become a big thing in my life as a hobby, or I was just going to make my start my own company and make mobile games. Because I felt mobile at the time in 2000, you know, 2009 or so was just starting. It was just becoming a thing because of the iPhone a lot, right? So, you know, I'm still very connected to the developer community, uh, one of the things I love Microsoft for, other than the Lumia devices, but they acquired that from Nokia, is Xbox. I think it's a really fantastic platform as a developer. It's a lot easier to code on. On It's always been a lot easier to code on Xbox than any other platform. Nintendo and Sony often being the hardest, depending on what generation platform you talk about. Nowadays, it's improved significantly. But in the PlayStation 3 days, I tell you, the PlayStation 3 is a... Is an incredible piece of hardware. If you're a hardware nerd like me, it's like, wow. But it's so hard to code on. Uh, it's almost hard for the sake of being hard, you know? Um, so I, I appreciate uh, development and I appreciate that Microsoft has always had a soft spot. I've always had a soft spot for them and because they have the best development environment ever made and that's Visual Studio. Uh, you guys probably possibly don't know this, but when you write code for the PlayStation or for a Nintendo device, you're not generally writing it uh, in their own, like in Eclipse or some kind of other IDE. You generally end up using Visual Studio on a Windows box with a cross compiler that is appropriate for the platform you use. And 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 I think Microsoft, for me, between the Xbox, the Lumia devices, and and Visual Studio. That's why I still love Microsoft. That's some other things I like, Cortana, for example. But, but like Windows, I've always hated Windows. Like even as a developer, like I used to write code for Mac OS Seven, and I loved it much more than writing code for Windows Thirty Two. But at the same time, you know, I have to appreciate 
uh, what the PC world has brought us. My Surface 3 is a, an incredible piece of hardware, but I'm still a Mac user, you know, like in PC and like in my personal computer world, it's Mac for me. And my portable world, it's Android for me, primarily in a bit of Windows Phone. Yeah, I just I want you to know that you've started uh, because you're talking about consoles and gaming. I believe you started a, a slight religious war in our chat room uh, oh, because you know it's my job. <laughs> I, I I went to Windows Central and did the Windows Central podcast at CES with uh, Dan Rubino, and it it it's still a ma massive debate going on in both the YouTube thread and the uh, the Windows Central blog thread because um you know i know i can't swear on your on your on your show but i was a mm, disturber if you know what i'm saying i i made some suggestions that angered the windows fans significantly suggestions like nokia sorry windows um, microsoft devices should make android phones because Sadia Nadella and his new crew don't care about Windows. They care about their ecosystem. They care about Office. They care about OneNote. They care about Xbox. They care about, you know, the ecosystem, not, not the OS. The OS is irrelevant. The hardware is irrelevant. It's all about the content. And the content lives in the ecosystem. Oh, my God. You should have seen what happened after that. It is all about it, the content. It's like We've a known sacrifice. That. It's like a sacrifice their firstborns. All of them. <laughs> In a ritual blood madness. I don't know what happened, but oh, they're still angry. So let them let them have fun in the in the chat room. I think it's healthy. I, I think I think the console war discussion has taken over for the PC versus Mac. No one really cares about the PC versus Mac versus Linux debate anymore. That has pretty much played itself out. But you start talking consoles, and yeah, you are you are slapping some sacred cows. Uh, uh, uh Miriam. Uh, I, somebody, wait, wait, somebody in the chat room doesn't believe I actually worked for Sony. I did. I worked, <laughs> I worked at a comp Sony Computer Entertainment from about 2008 till 2010. So, or maybe seven to nine, somewhere like that. Just check it out. It's, it's real. It happened. Oh, don't, anyway. don't, don't worry about the folks in the chat room. They, they say things every once in a while just to stir the pot. They're pot stirrers themselves. Uh, Miriam, before yes. the show, you were yeah. playing with a little <laughs> device, and uh, I had I had a segment ready to go for this thing that we call the tech, but uh, I'm thinking that maybe that needs to be what we take a look at because it is some special sauce. So uh, you think we can uh, take a look at it? Yeah. Okay, so, but before uh, we can do that, we we got, we got to do this one little thing. Yeah. All right, now, uh, I, I was kind of blown away. I know there's going to be some people who are going to be underwhelmed at first, but you got to stay for the entire segment. Miriam, <laughs> could you please show us what you're holding there? Yeah, so I'm holding a phone here, um, and I'll, I'll let you, wait. It's reflecting my screen. So this, what do you think this is? Quick uh, tally up in the chat room here. Oh, chat room, they, that's an Android phone, right? I mean, it looks like every other Android phone. Well, it is an Android phone, now, of course. But there's a, an interesting little thing about this Android phone. If I flip it over, it has another display. <laughs> and I'm sure if I get a little closer to my camera and it starts to finally focus, not on my face, but on the phone. Ah, really? Anyway, if you can read what says at the bottom, I don't know. My, I don't think my quality is big enough. Uh, yeah, you're still on, you're on standard def. Yeah. Anyway, it's a Yoda phone, too. And so anybody who knows what that is, it's um, here. I've, I've dimmed the front display so I can show it to you. Um, this is the front and it's still too bright. Wait, hang on. This is very strange because I actually dimmed the front earlier. Let me uh, lower the brightness to a reasonable level. Here we go. There you go. So here's the front standard five inch uh, 1080p AMOLED display, right? And in the back here, there's a QHD that's a quarter HD, not quad HD um, e-ink panel. And uh, let me show you what's interesting about this. Wait, wait, go, go ahead and talk over it. I'm going to do this so they can get a, a high def look at what it actually looks like. It's, this is yeah. a sexy device. So I showed you the front screen just a second ago, and now I've, I've actually copied the back. I've, I've mirrored the... Uh, 
I've mirrored the entire Android experience on the e-ink panel. So I can, uh, I'm going to try to do this backwards here, but let's see. Can I do this properly? So uh, here I, uh, I'm, uh, I'm basically going into the app tray and going through my apps. I can use the and that, that's an like e That's an e-ink screen. That's not an LCD yeah. screen. No, that's an e-ink. It's uh if my phone dies right now, the battery's dead. It, this is this is gonna stay up exactly like you see it. So say I want to draw, I want to start um, flip uh, Flipboard here and read my news for the day. Here's Flipboard, and uh, you know I can go into say Engadget, which is one of my feeds, since I used to work there. It's loading the feed as you can see. Let's see if I can get the camera to finally focus on this phone instead. And so here we go. We've we've loaded the first story, and of course I can do what anybody does with Flipboard, which is flip through the screens. It's still loading, but you get the idea. So as e ink, and of course, here the moment I want to, I can I can go like this, and now I am in Flipboard on the front. That's too right? cool. So you can flip be between the two sides like this at will. And other than that, it's a pretty much a normal, um, hey, look, I'm in the web browser all of a sudden. But, um, you know, here's my Nexus 5. Sorry, that's not a Nexus 5. That's a Lumia. Um, I get too many phones on me, as usual. Here's my Nexus 5. And side by side, you know, let's see if I can get a little further back. Here they are side by side. They're basically the same size device. And, you know, and the thickness is... Pretty much the same. The one I'm tapping is the Nexus. So this one here is the Yoda phone. So they're about, they both have wireless charging, Qi. They both have a Snapdragon 800, two gigs of RAM, uh, you know, uh, an eight megapixel camera. So they're very comparable. So in a way, you're kind of buying last year's specs. You're not driving the, the highest end specs. Got LTE and everything. This is a European model, so it has LTE band for Europe. But, um, you know, it's... It's a pretty much a flagship kind of device or maybe a higher end mid-range device if you want to call it that today. Do you have any feel yet on what it's going to do for battery life? Um, well, I, not really. I've only been using it for a few days. And what I've noticed that um, it's really, really good. Like if I'm using an e-ink, it's almost like I'm, I don't have a display attached to the device at all. And uh, I mean, you're not going to be playing games or watch videos. Although I want to show you something that is kind of cool. Hang on one sec. I'm just going to unlock the, the rear screen here real quick. And it's hard to do with one hand. So there we go. So what I want to show you is, so here's the rear screen, right? Uh, and I'm going to start the camera app. And now I can take a high-res selfie, right? And you can see my screen like it's... So this is the refresh rate. That's actually pretty good. I mean, for e-ink, that's actually spectacular. Right? So you can't watch a video on here or play a, a video game, or maybe a puzzle game would work. But, you know, it's pretty awesome that you can... Uh, let's see if I can do this. Uh, I'm upside down. But if I uh, bring up the Android controls here, I can go back to, you know, kill the app. And, you know, go back into the tray. You can see there's a bit of refresh going on. It has to refresh the whole screen from time to time. So uh, you can use this whole thing from the back screen or the front screen. You really, it's really your choice. And that's, that's the gimmick. I mean, it's not a gimmick, actually. That's the thing. Um, weak spots are probably the camera could be better. Uh, it is um, only 8 megapixels, no OIS. It's stock Android camera app. Um, it does the job. You know, it's a bit noisy and low light. It's not going to be... You're not going to write any great reviews about the camera, but it's not going to, it's going to serve you well. It's not going to be terrible, terrible. So that's about it, really. Uh, it doesn't have micro SD, 32 gigs of built in storage, uh, LT, as I said. Uh, I think it's, uh, it's either two or three gigs of RAM. Snapdragon 800, 32 gigs built in storage, uh, 4.7 inch OLED QHD display, sorry, uh, e ink QHD display on the back. And in the front here, there's a 5-inch 1080p AMOLED display, front-facing camera, usual bits and pieces. 
I, I'm just thinking, I mean, for my own personal usage, that would be huge because anytime I look at my battery meter, the screen is always 60%, 60% or 70% of what yeah, my power so, uses. So now um, I'm going to try to see what happens with this, like keep track of the screen and see how much of an improvement it is. is. You know, I didn't use it much today, but like I'm still at something like 90% and most of it, like 90 or 95%, most of it was e-ink. Uh, so that gives you an idea. The nice thing too is that... Um, I didn't show you, I show you the mirror function, which mirrors the entire OS on the back screen. But one of the big things is that if you're using the front screen, you can have the back screen kind of like have a bunch of widgets running on it. So like the weather, your calendar, uh, your to-do list, your, uh, your the time alarms you might have, anything that you think is relevant, you can push out there. They have a whole kind of like bunch of apps that they curate themselves, Yoda Phone, the company, to make it, to make the back screen more usable when your main screen is in use. Um, and also so that when your phone is just sitting on your table right next to you, you can glance at it and see interesting information like notifications or how many, you know, tweets you got or maybe an RSS feed of your tweets. Um, and, and the cool thing is that when that screen, whatever is on that screen, when your phone dies, stays on it, right? So if you have a very important thing like a to-do list that you cannot miss, uh, or in a calendar entry you cannot miss, you can have it stay on there even when the phone is basically a brick, right? So there's something there. And we've got Jab in the chat room saying, so wait a minute, you know, two screens that uses more power, but no, that's, that's the whole idea. I mean, imagine the things that you do on your phone, just reading a web page, yeah, reading an email that doesn't need a, a high power, super responsive screen. Now turn off the screen for that time and suddenly you're you're adding not hours but maybe days to your smartphone life. Exactly. And if you guys are not familiar with an e-ink display, hopefully you go to Wikipedia and read it because it's a pretty big deal in tech to not know what an e-ink display <laughs> is today, okay? Kindle's been around for five, six years now. Well, more than that. When is the first Kindle? 2006? Eight years. So the, the bottom line is e-ink only uses power when it refreshes. And when it refreshes, it uses very little power. So you can basically have a device with e-ink last. You know, the only thing that are going to kill you on a phone is going to be the radios, right? The connection to LTE, the connection to Wi-Fi, your Bluetooth connections. Um, maybe when you play music, the speaker or headphones, the headphone amp. But none of the display stuff is going to cost you anything. On this phone, if you don't use the normal screen, the main screen, you're not using any battery for displaying anything. Yeah. Uh, and that's what's amazing about it. Miriam, we have to do one last bit before we wrap it up. I promised uh, my uh, viewers on Twitter that we would take a look at a uh, quadcopter, a drone pilot doing something incredibly stupid. And uh, here <laughs> I love it drones. is. I don't like stupid drones. Oh, no, yeah, you're kidding me. They exactly. flew over an airport? He did. So this is in Istanbul. At, uh, Ataturk Airport is the fifth busiest airport in Europe. It serves more than 50 million passengers a year. And uh, here in the United States, at least, we know that the FAA has guidelines that says we're not allowed to fly within five miles of an airport. Uh, you, or at least you have to warn the tower that you're going to do it and get permission. Now, responsible hobbyists don't fly within 10 miles of an airport. But this pilot not only flew over an airport with an active taxiway, but let's see if I can, I can jump forward here. He actually came within 50 feet of the beacon, the landing beacon slash radar array. Uh, I mean, it's all sorts of dangers here. I mean, this this is the kind of person who, even though I, I love building and flying quadcopters, multi-rotors, drones, whatever you want to call them, but he, this kind of guy says, maybe my hobby should be banned because people <laughs> are going to do stupid things like this. I mean- what I'm amazed is that he's like right in front of the radar right now or whatever that is. Wouldn't they detect that and go like, what is that bird thing flying in front of our oh, radar? I'm sure they did. I'm sure there was someone at the airport who figured it out. But the problem is, how do you know? I mean, this right. the transmitter could have a range of 10 kilometers. He could be far, far away looking through goggles. So they don't know where he is. That's so dangerous. Yeah. Now, yeah, wow. here's the thing. This guy is actually a professional videographer from Turkey. His name is Aspit. Manukayan, or I, I'm sorry, I'm totally butchering his name, but the Internet's hate brigade has now turned on to this man because he doesn't think he did anything wrong. Uh, wow. And that's just, I mean, it kind of boggles my mind. Looking at this footage and seeing, I mean, you can actually see there are planes on the taxiways below him. If yeah. this thing, I mean, it doesn't have to be a collision. If this thing had distracted a pilot, if it had interrupted a flight path, that's not just a YouTube video. That's a major incident. 
Right. I mean, he like he's clearly high above in above the the actual landing and takeoff path. But it's just if an airplane has an emergency at this time, right, just before landing and decides to abort and fly at that flight level and hits that thing, uh, not good. Yeah. Especially if it gets ingested in an engine and the airplane is already in crisis. Well, the thing that it's I've been crazy. taught, you know, learning how to how to fly quadcopters is you have to assume that you're going to have a difficulty, a mechanical difficulty, a technical problem that will make your quadcopter fall out of the sky. And right. so you always have to be thinking, am I safe if my quadcopter falls out of the sky? If I'm over an airport, obviously I'm not safe for my quadcopter to fall out of the sky. Yeah, there's also that for sure. Absolutely. Oh, my. Wow, that's crazy. And look at that. Holy crap. I know, right? <laughs> this, this is ridiculous. He's following an airliner with passengers on it. <sighs> As Dr. Morbius in the chat room said, this wow. is why we can't have nice things. Yes. It does look pretty awesome, though, right? Uh, yeah. Okay. <laughs> the, yeah. Here's here's the problem. the problem. Right? This That's is probably how he's justifying it. He's like, "Well, dude, it's cool, man. Nothing bad happened, and look, it looks like the coolest footage. I can brag now. Yo, I have the <laughs> coolest footage on the planet. It is. It's beautiful footage, and it's it's kind of breathtaking. And if you take away the rage, you go, "Oh my gosh, I'm glad someone did this. It's just like the the people who fly their quadcopters through." Uh, fireworks displays. It looks gorgeous. And yeah, nothing happened. Nothing bad happened. But now imagine that there are tens, hundreds, thousands of people doing this. Something bad will happen. You bet. It's, uh, I don't, it's all be responsible. Uh, be oh, well, you know, I, it, it, what bothers me, honestly, is that, as you said, we can't have nice things. This is the kind of thing that will cause over-regulation on right. something they probably, you know, it, I agree that, in, you know, I'm the first who wants to see drones using used commercially in, in North America and the U.S. Um, and, you know, right now it's obviously really hard to, it's, it's a really hot topic, right? But I think that this is, you know, even though this is not in the U.S., this is exactly the kind of thing that right. the, the, the anti-drone people are going to use to say, well, why should we allow even commercial drones when this is happening, right? Well, I mean, this guy's a professional pho photographer, so he I'm would be one of the it. people who would get licensed. So, yeah. I mean, this is still not going to help. And, and you're absolutely right. Most people who fly, fly responsibly. They don't put anyone else in danger. They think, you know what, this may be a great shot, but am I willing to jeopardize the lives of how my, however many number of people? And they say, no, this may be a beautiful shot. I, again, I'm not taking that away. It's a gorgeous shot, but it's just not worth it. It really just no. isn't. No. Sorry. No, I agree. Crazy. Miriam, I want to thank you yes. so very much for being on Padre's Corner. Uh, it was an absolute pleasure, an honor to speak with you. I think our audience has much more appreciation for, for what you bring, uh, being on the Twit Network all the time. Uh, you're, you, you're a regular guest on, on <laughs> AAA. You're going to be in studio next week for Before You Buy, and uh, I'm yeah. going to have to find a way to sneak you back on the Padre's Corner. Could you please tell the folks at home where they can find you, where they can find your work, where they can catch sure. up with what um, you're covering. So I'm mostly known online as Tank Girl without the vowel. So T N K G R L. If you search for that, or my my name, which you know will pop up right there. It's on Twitter. You can see it. If you search for that, you'll find my blog. You'll find my Twitter. You'll find a lot of my handles. Um, there's a few I didn't get. YouTube is slightly different, but if you go from my blog to my YouTube, you'll find it. Um, I couldn't get the handle on every every network. But the the reality is, I do a podcast. You can see it here once once a, a month or so. It's very everything is very loose in my life in terms of timing. Um, but because this is my hobby, really, right? I, I don't really make money. I'm, I mean, I monetize the videos, but it's not insane or anything. So um, join me, subscribe to my podcast, check my blog from time to time. But the best thing is probably just follow me on Twitter or on G Plus or on Facebook. Facebook is a little harder to find because I only do public entries with friends. Um, and uh, yeah. You know, you can find me out there. Uh, if you are have any gigs you want uh, me to help with, uh, startups to launch or media stuff to help with, let me know. Uh, and uh, it's tankgirl at gmail, like my email. So it's just my handle at gmail.com, easy, easy peasy. So I hope to hear from you. Uh, and I hope to see you comment and, you know, be on, on, on the internets, on the social media with me. Miriam Joie, we thank you so very much for being on Padre's Corner. Uh, I, we will have you back, and uh, thank you for everything you bring 
to the field. Thank you so much for having me, Robert. It was an absolute pleasure. I will do it again anytime. I'll see you next time. Bye. Folks, that's the end of this episode of Padres Corner, but I want to thank you very much for, for sticking around. Uh, I, you know, you, you've been with me for such a long time, and you've really let me turn Padres Corner into something fun for the TWIT TV network. Remember that this started as just a little extra something something I did on Friday nights. Now, we're going to be returning to that. Starting in March, Padres Corner is moving back to Friday's nights. We're, we're actually going to turn it into sort of like Fridays with Padre. I'll be doing three shows on Friday. That's uh, This Weekend in Price Tech, Before You Buy, and Padres Corner. Monday will be Coding 101, and Thursdays will be Know How. Why, why do I tell this uh, to you? Well, because I want you to be able to check out all my shows. And in fact, if you want to check out Padres Corner and our back episodes, just go to twit.tv slash Padre. There you'll find all of our episodes, along with a way to get every episode of Padres Corner downloaded automatically into your device of choice. If you want it in your Android device, your laptop, your tablet, your desktop, your iOS device, whatever it may be, we'll give it to you. Also, don't forget that you can follow me on Twitter. Just go to twitter.com slash PadresJ. That's at PadresJ. If you follow me, you'll find out whatever it is I'm doing, including today, which was kind of really hard for me to get started. But you'll also see the topics I cover on all of my shows. You'll see what I've been doing during the week when I'm not on the Twit TV network. It's just a nice place to catch up with uh, me when I'm not here on the, on the live stream. Uh, don't forget that we do this show every day until every Tuesday night until March. I'm getting all confused here because I can't keep up with the schedule changes at 7.30 p.m. PST. But then we'll do the schedule change in March. And as long as you're going to watch us live, why not jump into the chat room at irc.twit.tv. It's part of the experiment that is Twit TV. We want to hear you. We want to get your feedback. And as you can see, I've got you guys right down here. So anytime you talk to us during the show, I can integrate your comments into the actual episode. Until next time, I'm Father Robert Palliser, the digital Jesuit. This has been Padre's Corner, and you've come out sane on the other side. Mm -hmm.